Greetings, brothers and sisters. Today we continue looking at 1 Thessalonians 1, concentrating more on 4 to 10, but I'll read the whole chapter. And I've entitled this particular devotion, The Genuineness of Faith. Paul, Silas and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we loved among, lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you become a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia, Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. This is another Absolutely terrific chapter, isn't it? We've looked at it a little bit, and now we're just looking at it again, just looking at the last number of verses. And it's an absolutely terrific chapter. You really feel the depth of the apostles' admiration for this group of believers in Thessalonica. My question is this, how do you know someone is a Christian and that comes out of the thought here it was because Paul is absolutely convinced about the genuineness of the Thessalonian Christians he writes this for we know brothers and sisters loved by God that he has chosen you that God has elected them into his family and we have to ask ourselves the question, how, how was he so positive about that? Some people would say in amongst Christians today, and I'm just echoing some thoughts, some people have said to me, well, do you really know if someone is a Christian or not? In other words, can you tell if they're really genuine? Some people even question their own faith. Am I really a Christian? Am I genuine? If I died today, would God really accept me into his heaven? People have that question mark about themselves. Paul was absolutely convinced that these people were chosen by God, that they were the elect. Other people in, among other Christians, we could say, are kind of convinced that nearly everyone is a Christian. You someone that hasn't even gone to church for years or someone that's never confessed faith in Jesus, but they would say, how do we know that they're not elect? And so you have kind of the opposite thought as well. But in this case, Paul was absolutely convinced of the genuineness of the faith of the Thessalonian Christians. And we're going to see why as we explore this text together. Mainly, brothers and sisters, it was because of the effect of the gospel on their lives. We read this in verse 5, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. I really love that. In other words, Paul, when he preached, knew that the people didn't just hear him, but their lives would change because of what they heard. I was thinking about the Jewish believers. So Paul preached, we read 
in Acts 17 in the synagogue over three successive Sundays or Saturdays, Sabbath days. And people must have been genuinely moved in the synagogue. Those who are Jewish, those who are God-fearers. They are people that are, go to the synagogue but aren't Jewish in nationality and they haven't done all the rites of becoming a Jew either. But when Paul talks about the genuineness of their faith, this deep conviction, he has seen the change that the gospel has made. They realise that their righteousness, their status with God does not depend on the laws that they were keeping or even on their circumcision or about the festivals they were keeping or the food they were eating, but solely based on the work of Jesus Christ in their lives, that he paid the punishment on the cross for their sins and the guilt of their sins. He saw it, he heard it, and he believed what they said because they did it in an atmosphere of suffering. Then you have the non-Jewish people, how they reacted to the gospel. They would have turned away from their idol worship. They would have turned away from the sacrifices they made at idol temples and would have put all their hope and trust again in Jesus Christ for their righteousness, not on what they did in their sacrifices, but on what Christ has done for them on the cross. And they too did this in an atmosphere of suffering because as we know, as we've been looking at the Thessalonian church, that this city really wanted to protect its status as a free city under Roman rule. And when I say free city, that they could run their own affairs. And we know from reading Acts 17 that they'd placed Jason and others, they had placed a fine on them. They, these people had a bond on them. They were suffering persecution for their faith. And so that proves the genuineness of it. In the atmosphere of persecution, they trusted in Jesus Christ as their hope. They, all their confidence was in him and they had a deep assurance then of salvation, a deep conviction. So what is a deep conviction? And uh, we've talked about that. It is, in my thinking, simply the ability to suffer for what you believe in, not to go with the wind of uh, different thoughts, just getting blown to and fro, but having a deep conviction, deep rooted conviction, assurance that you are a believer and that you put all your trust in Jesus. Now, the last part of the passage is also uh, pretty good. You became imitators of us and of the Lord for you welcome the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. So it's suffering with joy. So I just wanted to again look at the last part. And so you became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, which is Greece, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. They became a model of what it is to be a Christian. And yet they're confident as well. And they all, and to await for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. So what a wonderful group of Christians that we've looked at now. Paul's so confident, he calls them the elect, the chosen. He's got that conviction in his own heart because of what he has seen in them. The outworking of genuine faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So my question is this, how do you tell if you have this deep conviction about the gospel in your life? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to again look at your word and to look at the Thessalonian Christians. So far, we've been really encouraged by what we've read about them. And we admire their deep conviction, their confidence in the work of Christ for them on the cross and their willingness to forsake idols and to turn away from any self-righteousness that they would have. We pray, Lord, that our own faith would be genuine and Lord, today we know that there are 
there is a pretty strong wind of persecution against Christians. And we're thankful, Lord, when we can stand up and we can see that we too are willing to suffer for our faith. Help us to be firm in that. Heavenly Father, we also want to pray for the older members in our churches. We think of those who have been models for us of faith and consistency in the faith. And we pray, Lord, that we too would be a model for those who follow us. But Lord, being older has its own challenges in terms of health and managing of that health. And we pray for the Lord's comfort and grace on them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.